Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, October the 12th, and we have a very full board briefing agenda this morning. Lots of stuff going on. Um, in accordance with the declaration of emergency announced on March 11th of 2020 and extended by the Board of County Commissioners on June 24th, 2021, today's meeting is being held virtually. I want to thank everyone for bearing with us through any technical difficulties that may arise. Please remember to mute your mic when you're not speaking. And before you present, make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. Our first briefing this morning is on the Library Capital Bond Program. Bailey Elke, good morning. Good morning, Chair Kafora. I'm actually going to kick it over to Tracy Massey. Tracy Massey, good morning. Good morning. Yes. Well, uh, good morning, uh, Chair Kafori and Commissioners. My name is Tracy Massey, and I am the Director of the Department of County Assets and Chief Information Officer. I am pleased to be here today with uh, Bailey Elke and Mike Day providing a briefing to the board on the Library Capital Bond Program. Uh, we have made sizable progress since we were last year, I think back in June, and um, are pleased to give you this update. Um, next slide, please. So here is our agenda. We have 30 minutes and quite a, a lot to get through, so we'll get right to it. Um, we will start with a um, land acknowledgement and uh, overview of the library's mission and sort of the overall structure supporting the bond program. Uh, then we will be presenting the bond program plan that includes the scope schedule um, and budget, and that's related to the FAC1 briefing that's coming up later this month. Then we'll give quite a bit of uh, bond project updates and uh, decisions and uh, upcoming approvals and next steps. So that's the agenda for today. Um, next slide, please. All right, uh, the uh, giving a land acknowledgement is important for our program management office team. And so I'm going to do this today. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on. The Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala bands of the Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. We acknowledge the ancestors of this place and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. All right, it's gonna go over to Bailey next. Next slide, please. Good morning, Chair Kafori and Commissioners. I'm Bailey Elke, Director of Libraries. Nice to see you all here this morning. Um, just a little re quick reminder, the, the library's mission, our pillars, which are immutable, and then our priorities, which we update every few years, are really a bedrock for how we're approaching this overall program. Next slide, please. Um, this is, as you, I think, are aware, a really deep partnership between the Department of County Assets and the Library District. Things really got real in January of 21 when um, we the bond sale happened. That is when we really dug into the timeline and the sequencing in order to update the overall project with both, you know, new information on costs, et cetera, as well as the bond spend down requirements. I want to call out the very clever literary themes that are associated with these projects. The preface is the operations center. Chapter one includes both the Holgate and Midland libraries, as well as the Albina and North Portland libraries. Chapter two is the East County flagship. Chapter three is the remaining Belmont, Northwest and St. John's libraries. The refresh projects, which impact all the other projects not in um, this bond um, formally or completely, <laughs> uh, as well as all of the automated materials handling, and then our IT and our broadband improvements are part of that. And today we're going to be focusing on the preface and chapter one, and you'll hear more about that from Mike. Next slide, please. Well, thank you, Bailey, and I'll uh... 
hold on a little bit from here. Uh, my name is Mike Day. I'm the bond program director and good morning to four and commissioners. Uh, this morning, we'll walk you through uh, just kind of our overall bond program plan, which we will be coming back on the 21st for our formal fact one approval process. But we will finalize the overall project scope, schedule, budget, all those important things that are part of a capital development process. Uh, we'll also highlight uh, some of our specific projects, as Bailey mentioned, our Preface Operations Center and Chapter 1 projects that are now underway. Um, so we've got our project teams fully engaged, and we've got uh, much more to share with you regarding the progress on those. So with the bond uh, program plan, again, you know, we will, uh, in these slides and in today's presentation, we'll go over the kind of the framework for project scope for all of the bond uh, projects, the overall kind of project sequencing and scheduling, how the budget's allocated across the bond program, and then the general timelines for when we'll be coming back to the board for fact one approvals, as well as future briefings uh, to the Board of County Commissioners. Go ahead and go on to the next slide now, and we'll go right into now the overall uh, bond program plan project scope of work. This is what uh, was presented to the voters uh, in, in November of 2020. And that is approved. Program that we're moving forward with. So as you can see, uh, we have uh, what we consider to be kind of the nine major projects: the operations center, uh, the four uh, chapter one library projects within Holgate, North Portland, and Albina. All of those are now in that early programming phase, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then the East County flagship uh, uh, project, which we're currently in a site due diligence phase on, and then our chapter three projects after that. Um, go ahead and shift on to the next slide, and this will just give you the, you know, the visual representation of that overall project sequencing uh, that you know, we've established as part of our timeline really for the next uh, four to five years. Um, currently, as, as we've already shared with you, we are engaged with the preface and chapter one work, and we'll talk more about that in our project update uh, part of the presentation this morning. Go ahead and move on to the next slide. Do it. So the, the, the big picture overall bond budget, nothing's changed, uh, everything is, uh, on track uh, with regard to the $387 million uh, bond. We are tracking an owner contingency within that. Uh, and then as part of the bond spend down requirements, you know, we do have the general obligation bonds, uh, a spend down requirement that aligns with the project sequencing that I just shared with you. In addition to that, with the bond sale that took place last January, uh, there, was a, there was a bond premium reserve and that reserve is really being set aside for future contingency use, uh, market conditions, those types of things that we just want to make sure we're being good stewards of the bond dollars for the taxpayers. Let me, let me uh, drill down a little bit in more detail with the next slide and show you how we've broken that down. Go ahead and move on to the next slide if you would. And this, this really kind of takes you to that next layer of detail and looking at the, uh, the June uh, approval that we received or how that breaks down between the, the nine major projects as well as the refresh work and the broadband work. So you can see in that highlight in the middle, um, there's that the breakdown that really goes into the detail for, from the operation center all the way down and to the bottom where we uh, tracking to the overall budget. We did a sensitivity analysis too around kind of that low high range of, of what that might look like. But again, we are tracking to uh, and we'll be coming to you with, uh, with this as part of our fact one process for approval. Go on to the next slide. So future fact one approvals and board briefings, it's just kind of gives you a sense as to what that cadence will look like uh, as we come back to you for future board briefings every three to four months. 
kind of way in progress and updates on various projects. Uh, the FAC1 approval timing uh, specific to projects, and that being closer to when we uh, get to the GMP or the guaranteed maximum price uh, contracting phase with our CMGC partners. And that's really towards the end of the design, uh, detailed design documentation prior to construction. Uh, right around the permitting phase uh, is when that would be established. So down below here with the operations center and the chapter one work and the East flagship and then the chapter three projects, you can see what those approximate timeframes look like with the operations center really being the first you know, project out of the gate. I will be coming back in the spring of 2022 uh, with that guaranteed maximum price, which will also have scope, schedule, budget, all of those things wrapped into that fact one approval process. Okay, let's uh, move on now and go on to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the projects and specific project updates. And Bailey, I wanted to just hand it back to you for a second to yeah. kind of introduce it. Yeah, um, hello again. So you'll all probably be familiar with this map. This identifies what we call our communities of opportunity. And um, the library has made a long commitment to serving folks in this community facing the greatest barriers. So a couple things to note about this map, in addition to identifying all of the projects that are currently um, part of this bond program, those are the dark, the black dots and the black star. Those are all of the projects that will happen. The green circles identify the projects that are part of this update today. But I'd also like to note the distribution of those projects across the county. I really appreciate that. And the fact that um, a, a good uh, percentage of them are in Mid and East County where we early on identified a need for more library space. So uh, I think it's back to you, Mike. Great, thank you. Let's move on to the next slide, please. All right, uh, operation center. So uh, we we have a, a great milestone that we just want to celebrate and acknowledge, and that is the uh, the purchase and sale agreement for the former Safeway site uh, in uh, Northeast Portland, uh, Northeast Gleason, and 22nd Avenue. So that is the location, and these are the aerial views and a and a view looking at the, the old Safeway site that is going to be transformed into our new operations center. And we're very excited to share some perspectives and updates on that with you, as well as where our overall project team is at. Can we move to the next slide, please? This is a, a current uh, rendering and massing study that our architect, Hemadiri Eddy, has recently done as part of the schematic design phase as we move out of the programming and we're now really in that schematic design where we begin to really see how all the parts and pieces of the program are coming together. And so you can see how the old Safeway site is truly being transformed into uh, a operation. You could say unrecognizable. <laughs> yes. It, it will look significantly different. Uh, and uh, what's exciting about this too is that because of the site, its location and the overall uh, context around solar, we have a great opportunity uh, because of the footprint of the building to really take advantage of clean energy technology. Um, the Oregon Department of Energy has a requirement for all public projects that we apply one and a half percent of our projects specifically to green energy technologies. So we, as a bond uh, program, we really look at this as a, a project where we can take full, full advantage of that. And, and we're even looking into the possibility of a net zero building. We're really taking the highest and best use and full advantage of, of this facility. Go ahead and move to the next slide, please. So the design and program, budget and schedule, these are gonna be kind of how we walk through the slides in our project updates. Uh, for context, we are in that transition now from our schematic design uh, phase 
and we're moving into what's called the design development phase. Um, what that really represents really is, uh, as you think about a, a funnel, a funnel is really big when you kind of start the top of the funnel and it gets narrower and narrower. So as we go through the iterations of our design process from the schematic design, which is still very conceptual into design development, we get into uh, the nuts and the bolts and the details of how the brick and mortar and how all the pieces come together. So that's really the phase we're entering into. Um, we've gone through a technical review with our internal stakeholder groups and have had a, a very integrated process uh, between DCA uh, as well as library user groups uh, as part of that process. So it's been a, a really strong, integrated, and kind of working as one uh, team approach on this project. With every major kind of phase of the design, we also have uh, two different parties that go through a uh, third party estimator uh, through our architect and then our CNBC partner that go through a very detailed analysis of the cost. So we're in the middle of reconciling and finalizing that review process. Uh, overall, everything is tracking uh, within that kind of that range of where we would expect to be in terms of the budget. So that's great news there. Uh, and we're not uh, looking at any contingency uses or allocations at this point uh, from the project budget for the operations center. Again, uh, we will be coming back uh, as we work through the various uh, iterations of the design and gets closer to the permit process in the uh, late spring of 2022 before construction starts uh, with the fact one approval uh, with the guaranteed maximum price. The construction start is scheduled for this summer with a fall. Um, there, there is a little little error there I just just discovered. The construction start is this next summer of 2022 with the completion in the fall of 2023. So uh, my apologies for that error. We missed that in mean, this update. Go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right, now let's uh, talk about, uh, we've, we've packaged our chapter one projects into two groupings. The whole gate and Midland are one grouping and so we have project delivery teams consisting of our architect and contractor and owner rep that are um, the same group for serving Holgate and Midland. And then similarly with uh, North Portland and Albina, uh, we've taken that same approach. So this gives you that kind of aerial rendering of both Holgate and Midland. Uh, Holgate being a, um, a new construction where we're tearing down the existing facility and building new. Whereas Midland is a combination of renovation of the existing facility with a smaller addition. Talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get into the details here and in future updates. Uh, sure. Go ahead and move to the next slide if you would. So Bailey's going to spend a little bit of time here in a minute uh, giving a, a a sense as to this community engagement piece that we really want to talk uh, with you about today. And that's really this early kind of foundational phase of the design and the programming where we are engaging both with our internal stakeholders, but also uh, with our community and, and just a very robust outreach process that's external facing to our community members within the, the areas that these libraries are serving. The project's team, uh, again, has just come on board with our general contractor and our architect team. So those teams are just forming now. And then we have a third party owner representative as well that's represented. So those teams will be later this month and into November going through that early budget uh, baseline kind of scoping of budget and program uh, and aligning that with our overall target budget. It's very early on. so. Uh, there's no contingency forecast usage uh, against anything from a programming perspective because we're just kind of figuring out from a program program standpoint, you know, what's in, what's not, and what do all the pieces look like. So there on the, the scheduling front, you can kind of see that the process of where we're at with the overall schedule with really um, 2023 being when we'll be coming back uh, for uh, 
backing approval and a construction start uh, in probably first quarter of 2023. So that's probably 15, 16 months out before we are uh, digging in the dirt and uh, moving concrete and building buildings. Spring of 2024 uh, is our target date for the opening of both Midland and Holgate. So that kind of gives you that broader perspective of those projects. Now I'm going to shift gears here and let's talk a little bit about the community engagement and how that's going. Bailey? Thanks, Mike. Next slide, please. So um, early on, we identified a, a real com strong commitment to community engagement and Mike um, referenced that in the, in the previous slide. And that's both internally to our staff, but also really emphasizing um, getting input from the communities that these branches will be serving. The Holgate and Midland projects are um, sort of in the early stages. Back in August, uh, they did a really kind of amazing design justice training that grounds all of us um, related to these projects in that, that theory and helps us understand what we're taking into account in designing these spaces and how we engage the community. As you can imagine during COVID, community engagement is kind of a, a, a little bit of a challenge, um, but these teams are being really flexible in terms of are they in-person, are they virtual meetings, how to make that happen. And um, I'll talk a little bit at a high level about the, the um, timeline for the Holgate and Midland community engagement. Next slide, please. So this is a sort of a general timeline for the Holgate and Midland projects. Um, they, they've really been meeting with staff early on and getting a sort of a sense of what the needs are from that perspective and we'll be kicking into higher gear um, very soon, mid-October, um, in terms of like those public engagements, both virtually um, with surveys and mailings and all that kind of thing. One of the things I really want to um, highlight is a, a program we're using called CDA, Community Design Advocates. I'm super excited about this. There's an element of this in, in both of these groups of projects. And this is an opportunity to actually hire, pay, people from the community to sort of bridge that gap between the community and the overall design process. And those will fo be folks who are from those communities, have live in those communities, are able to bring those authentic concerns and experiences and um, aspirations for these projects to the design of these buildings. I'm super excited about that. And this will continue through uh, December. Next slide, please. Well, Mike. Thanks, thanks really. That's a great segue into our other two chapter one projects, Albina uh, and North Portland. Um, and you can see here with this aerial, we've got kind of a, a, an interesting combination with Albina and the uh, historic building, the, the, the Carnegie building, uh, that is a, definitely a, a historic part of our community and how that will be renovated but preserved um, as part of the overall programming. Whereas the uh, existing operations building and the warehouse area to the south uh, are planned to be demolished and removed and then that area really will be become the, the location for uh, where the major new program for the new library as a part of Albina to be. So again we're just in the, the, the same kind of cycle with Midland and Fullgate. Uh, with the project teams kicking off, early site surveys, uh, some of the community engagement, which we'll talk more about here uh, in a few minutes uh, for Albina and, and North Portland. Let's move on to the next slide. And this is similarly, the next slide we'll share with you just that aerial view of, of the historic building uh, with uh, North Portland. This is primarily a renovation with a small addition uh, it's a beautiful building, and so they're uh, just preserving the integrity of, of this historic building. I think it will be a very important part of the program uh, as we look at and uh, really bring kind of the, the new 2021 library best practices into the, the North Portland community. 
Let's talk about a little, little bit uh, on the specifics of where we're at with both North Portland and Albany now, and go ahead and move to the next slide if you would. So similar in terms of our reporting and updating, uh, we'll talk a little more about the community engagement and some recent events that we had here over the last uh, few weeks. Um, and that engaging process of uh, really looking at the program and how that program intersects uh, with the design uh, process for our community. Similarly, we have uh, project teams that are uh, beginning to engage in the discussions around the construction budget, the validating of that budget, uh, and how that aligns with our overall bond program budget. No contingency use at this point. And then with the schedule uh, for North Portland, the schedule, it's not as large of a project as Albina. So, so that schedule is on a, a faster track than the Albina project. Both projects uh, will be coming back to you in early sprint, early uh, 2023 with the fact one of the process as we get to the DMP. And then with the construction starts, similar timeframes in the spring of 2023 with about a 12 to 14 month cycle, depending on which project uh, for North Portland and Albina. So there's a spring of 2024 for North Portland and Albina uh, in the sometime in the fall. As with every project in the early conceptual phase, uh, we're looking at big milestones. And as the project team really peels back the layers and looks at the details, looks at the permitting process um, and all those elements that go into the design process, We'll have more information to share with you in future future updates around the specifics on targeted milestones with the project sequencing. Okay, let's talk more about uh, what we're doing with our community engagement process here. Next slide. Mike. So you'll, this is familiar. Um, this is the overall timeline as it stands for the Albina and North Portland projects. This this community engagement is a little bit further along than the Midland and Holgate. Projects. Um, one of the things I want to highlight here, sort of similar to the, the community design advocates that are a part of the Midland and Holgate projects, this these uh, two programs will have what, what are called Yodas, not to be confused with the Jedi Master. Um, youth, uh, uh, I always get the O wrong, Youth opportunity design advocates. Thank you, Tracy. I see you nodding. And these are teens that are actually recruited from uh, the community. They're paid for their time. Not only do they represent their communities, but I think more importantly, they're part of the process, the overall design process all the way through. So they get this kind of amazing experience in terms of what it's like to do these sorts of projects and to be involved. Um, Albina and North Portland have already held, as Mike mentioned, they've done a, a virtual community engagement and online meeting. I think about a little over 70 people attended that. A couple days later, they did an in-person community engagement event at King Park, and they had about 120 people participate in that event and provide feedback on the programming of those spaces and what they're hoping for. Those, those events will continue over time. Uh, through December, similarly, a combination of, as Katie O'Dell says, hi-fi and lo-fi opportunities to engage with people, um, depending on sort of what the opportunities are around COVID and in-person opportunities. So super excited about these community engagement efforts. Next slide, please. Oh, that's me. <laughs> so these are photos <laughs> from those two events that I just referenced, the virtual one that happened about two weeks ago, and then a couple days later in the park at um, King Park, which is next to um, the farmer's market there. So they got some nice feedback and uh, those sorts of opportunities will continue. Next slide, please. And these are the youth engagement, uh, youth opportunity design advocacy. These are just representations of how they've been used on other projects. As I said, this is, um, I think, a really unique element of this overall process. We are um, hoping to get our applications all in by October 15th and have it, these folks on board in early November to really start informing the process, but also learning about what it means to design these spaces. 
Thanks, Next Rachel. slide. Yeah, that was great. I the Yoda program is just it just warms my heart. Um, as someone who's been in this industry for uh, 40 years and just uh, knowing that those opportunities for young people uh, to learn about our industry, uh, both on the design side and the construction side, and uh, with our partners, uh, Lever, Nolan, Tam on the architectural side, and with Anderson Construction. Uh, on the contracting side, um, you know, we have that kind of fully integrated process with a team that's um, very much behind this. So we're really excited to see uh, what comes out of that process. And it's it's not going to just be a short term thing. It's going to be over the, the life of these projects. And more to come on that uh, and many, many stories I'm sure that we'll be able to share in the future. Um, a quick update on the refresh. The, the refresh projects are um, the the other projects that are not part of the, the major nine projects. Uh, and these are projects where there may be technology, automated material handling, carpet, paint, um, ADAs, some of those types of minor re what we call refresh uh, work that will be happening at uh, the other libraries across the portfolio um, of the library district. Uh, we do have a, an overall budget that we've gone through an early vetting process on that we feel uh, very confident will cover those, those needs and we're beginning with our project manager to meet with uh, the various um, stakeholders internally to really identify on a project level and prioritize uh, what those needs are going to be. So, We'll have more on that as far as the project sequencing right now. We're just kind of identifying an overall time frame for all of that work that will happen over the course of the life of the bond, and then we'll prioritize that based on need one and also the our spend down requirements um, and those obligations that we have for the dental obligation bond. Go ahead and move on to the next slide. You know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is such a, an important value uh, for the county and the library, and uh, that emphasis uh, is a common thread through every aspect of what we do um, at the PMO level, at the library leadership level, at the county level, and, and, and we're continuing to really emphasize and build on that uh, through our procurement phase and our chapter one projects and our, our preface work that we have with the five projects that are underway. We're introducing uh, similar to what was on health headquarters and the county courthouse uh, project labor agreement and working with Jed Tompkins and internally with legal on uh, the framework of what that project labor agreement will look like. So we'll have more to share with you on that in the future. Um, job site culture. Um, and just really embracing strong uh, job site culture that honors uh, people uh, across the board. Uh, we use the Green Dot program, as you may recall, on the, the courthouse project. And really, uh, programs like that are the types of programs that we want to uh, work with our general contractors on to really uh, engage with the workforce uh, so that they are honored and respected. Uh, on the projects. The robust community engagement, of course, is a part of that as we reach into our communities and come alongside our community partners and equity partners uh, as well. And then the, the, the quantitative piece of the focus on building COVID certified firms and BIPOC firms uh, within that too, um, and, and building up that capacity within our communities for uh, certified firms that are minority women, they're just small businesses and disadvantaged businesses. I'll give you a, a little more detail now, if we can move to the next slide on just some of the specifics and some of the kind of metrics that we're working with and I'll just, I'll just highlight a few things. Um, earlier this summer, we developed a white paper that's been shared um, that really outlines and summarizes the, the goals and the purpose and the why behind uh, a project labor agreement. That's been shared now with our CMGC partners, and we're actually just beginning to sit down and develop the diversity plans with our contractor partners uh, to really establish those guidelines for both the workforce uh, as well as meeting our COVID 
targeted goals. For our contractors, are, uh, we're very early in those in that stage of developing those goals, but I will say at least at this point, uh, we're targeting in the 25 to 35% range for um, COVID certified firms participation at the project level. So that's very exciting. We're continuing to kind of push that envelope uh, with a focus on really uh, reaching into uh, emerging small businesses, minority businesses, and women-owned businesses. Um, the implementation, of, as far as just kind of some of the issues and risks that are always out in front of us that we, we want to be uh, uh, aware of so that we can manage to them is the implementation of the project labor agreement, which is uh, being done at the regional level, but they'll also be piggybacked on through the library bond program. So we're, we're well into that uh, partnership and, and developing the of the final nuts and bolts of what that project labor agreement would look like. We expect that to be um, completed and amended, and but really in the first quarter of um, 2022, the implementation of that it says the end of end of 2021, but it probably will move into the first quarter of 2022 uh, with the final development of that project labor agreement. Timing of that actually works quite well with where we're at with our contractors uh, since construction really won't start on our first early project until next June. So timing wise, uh, we feel pretty comfortable about the adopting and amending of that project labor agreement. We're also working hand in hand with our community partners with Awami, with PDBG, uh, with NAMAC uh, uh, to to make sure that there is this very strong engagement integrated process uh, with our community partners to build awareness of where those contracting opportunities are as we move forward um, with our CNGC partners. Go ahead and move on to the next slide. And I think this is a Maybe a Bailey or it's for, me. it's it's for me. Thanks, Mike. I know I'm going to try to wrap this up here. So, um, 1 of the requirements of the bond overall is a is the bond oversight committee. Uh, the purpose of the library capital bond oversight committee is to provide independent oversight and public accountability of uh, progress. The committee will be meeting quarterly and will prepare an annual report. Um, on Thursday, you will find the proposed membership um, on the consent agenda. We have 10 committee members who represent a really diverse uh, backgrounds and experience, and we are really excited about their level of interest and commitment to uh, the library and the county. Um, we expect to for that group to meet for the first time before Thanksgiving before we move into the holidays. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, key decisions. Um, in addition to the consent agenda on this coming Thursday on October 21st next week, we will be pre presenting the FAC1 board, um, the FAC1 to the board for approval of the bond program that was just outlined here um, in this presentation today. So that's the next sort of decision point in our process. Um, next slide. And then our next steps, I think both Mike and Bailey outlined a number of these, but we have a lot of community outreach events coming up, um, including selecting the members of both Yoda and the CDA programs. Uh, we're crafting a community wide bond update to tell everybody about the bond program and where we are. And then there's all of the regular project management work around uh, project schedules, sequencing, ensuring the budget aligns up with where we are in the design process and programming, um, moving forward with all of the DEI um, work as Mike outlined, and then moving into the chapter two um, phase of the project looking at releasing procurements uh, for the Chapter 2 flagship in early uh, 2022. So I think that is it for our presentation. We can now open it up for questions. Wonderful, thank you. Commissioners, questions, comments? Um, we will start with Commissioner Vega-Peterson. 
Just flip a coin. <laughs> Smiling at the camera. You can go first. Um, so thank you guys so much. This is so exciting. Um, Tracy and Mike and Bailey, like it's so, you know, there's so much enthusiasm and support for this huge project that we're doing. And it's great to get these updates. And I'm looking forward to having the, you know, have them every few months. I'm sure the next one will delve in more to the flagship um, um, building because that's that's a really exciting one too. But I was really pleased to hear all of the work that's happening um, already. Um, I mentioned this at a different meeting when we had a, a library, um, but I can't tell you how um, like strongly the support and, and the excitement around the operations center out here at 122nd and Gleason has been. I mentioned before, but we shared something on my Facebook page and it was shared like 28 times with other people. Like it just like people are really excited about this news and even, you know, and just seeing the, the buildings um, the, the draft of the building, like, it's just going to be such an incredible, um, like landmark, I think in, in the neighborhood. So I really am, um, appreciative of that. And it's of course exciting that it's going to be a net zero building, um, or close to it as, you know, but having all that solar is wonderful. Um, I also, you know, I just really loved the idea of having both the community design advocates and the, the Yoda team. Like, I think that's such a great way of bringing community in, in a real meaningful, impactful way to these projects. And I think that, you know, has a huge, um, just, just a different tone of, of how we're really looking at um, um, the way that we're doing these projects and how community can be a part of that. So I really um, appreciate that and appreciated all of the, the updates on the DEI work and the project labor agreement, as well as obviously those are keys to this. Um, and then I just wanted to say, I really appreciated the land acknowledgement at the beginning of it. So thank you for adding that um, as a part of the presentation. No questions, just just really um, great. Oh, I, I mean, I just, I'm so curious about how you're gonna get 6,000 more square feet of space in Midland Library now. <laughs> oh my God, but I was like, is it gonna, how are you gonna do that? So that'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing that when you guys get those plans solidified. Thank you. Commissioner, if I may, um, you know, when we first started talking about this, I made some comment at a at a community meeting about the op center being like the least sexy of all the projects. And and it's it's interesting and amusing to me to hear the sorts of receptions we're getting that you're describing. It's fabulous. I'm like, it's an operations center, but people are loving it and I'm really happy about that. Yeah, and it's just and it's an investment in a community that hasn't seen like really thoughtful design and really um uh, you know, intentional building uh, and use of the space. So I think people are super excited about that. Mr. Jaipal. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, everybody. I, you know, kind of just ditto, ditto, ditto to everything Mr. Vega Peterson just said. This is so exciting. It is exciting to see drawings. Um, uh, Bailey, I think solar is sexy. So maybe that's maybe that's what's driving it. <laughs> that can be the catchphrase. <laughs> Um, no, it's, it's, it's all wonderful. You know, I too really appreciated the community engagement, how thoughtful that design of what the community engagement is going to be and what the timeline is going to be. Um, I was curious on that. It looked like there were slightly different models between the, the sort of Midland and, and the North Portland Albina, you know, with the community development advocates. I don't know if I'm getting it right in one and the Yoda and the other. So just a little bit curious about what drove um some of those differences I'm, um i i can kick kick this off and then mike may have some additional information it's really about the two different teams that are working on the community engagement um uh the people uh co-locate which is working on the um midland and holgate branches and the um, Nolan Tam group that is working on the uh, North Portland Alberta. It's just their their approaches. You know, they each brought those um, the community design advocates and the the Yoda uh, models. You know, independently from their past sort of approaches to community engagement. So it's really it's just I don't know if you have anything to add, Mike, but I think it's more about there's definitely a through line. We as part of the PMO, we have people we've hired specifically to do community engagement overall. So there's a lot of communication between the folks uh, um, on the county side and then the the um, the folks with A and E and the and and their their community engagement process. Yeah, no, I think it's just to echo your comment, uh, Bailey, it's just we have two different uh, 
design teams in terms of their approaches, but there is this cross pollination uh, with our PMO that we've set up so that uh, between those design firms, while they have separate responsibilities and contracts and deliverables, um, they're actually engaging with each other as partners so that we do have that collaboration and that common thread in terms of overarching goals of uh, how we want to make sure that from a programming perspective, uh, listening sessions, how we're reaching into our communities uh, uh, with those specifics. And we have a dedicated community engagement coordinator resource within our PMO that's helping to organize that. And she's doing a fabulous job of kind of bringing that all together so that these folks over here aren't siloed into what they're doing they're, that's drastically different from other, other project, projects. We also want to take from this, you know, what we learn and build on that as we look to the future flagship and the chapter three projects. Well, it's it's wonderful that that that's interesting to to you know think about the different ways that the teams are doing this and um, wonderful that it's being brought together. I was so excited to hear 120 people showed up at King. I, that's amazing. That is that is a lot of people, and I think it just reminds us once again of how how our libraries are valued as as a civic resource. Um, I also really appreciated the the detail that you provided on the DEI piece and. Um, those project labor agreements, you know, again, I'm kind of curious to see how it's going to unfold um, to, for example, implement some of our workforce goals, because it's, it is about the COVID firms and contracting, and it's also about workforce um, and how we're going to, to tackle that piece of it when we've got these discrete projects over a longer period of time. But um, I'll, I'll be looking forward to hearing more about that because I think that's such an important piece of all of our projects. So no, no, no other questions. Just thank you. Really exciting. And our team is working really hard on that. Let your last point, uh, Commissioner Jayapal said there. Um, each project that we undertake, um, we strive to beat our last goals. And the courthouse was just such an amazing tale of success in engaging um, a broad variety of different firms, especially women in, in um, small business and minority owned. So we are going to have even higher goals for these new projects coming up and doing laying the groundwork right now. So lots of work going on. And then Commissioner Myron, I, I see your screen, but I don't see your face. Are you on the call? I am indeed on the call. I was able to connect. Thank you. Um, but it's iffy on uh, video. So, um, but I would uh, basically like to echo uh, both my fellow commissioners comments and just and add to that what I love so much, I love so much about this. Thank you so much, Bailey and Mike for this presentation. And I just, I look, it's uh, wonderful to see the progress that's happening, to see the beautiful renderings. Um, and I think it's just been highlighted the uh, incredible engagement and we always we engage so well and it is such a priority for us um, but you this takes it even to the next level I just love the um the concept of the the CDAs and the Yodas and compensating the people who are in the community uh, to for their time and for their work in um, in helping us to build the best uh, libraries that can meet the needs of the community. Uh, I also love the design justice training concept and like, I would love, I would just love to go to one of those trainings. Um, and, and of course, the aspect of the green buildings uh, and, and basically everything. There's much to love here and just thank you to you and your team for all the work for your presentation here today. And that's it. Thanks team. We're running a little behind on our schedule already. So I want to um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the information. Look forward to hearing from you again. Um, and now we will move on to our next briefing this morning, which is on the Multnomah County Labor Harmony Initiative. <laughs> it's an understatement to say that circumstances have changed dramatically since we began discussions about labor harmony over three years ago. 
In the wake of a global pandemic that upended all kinds of industries and sectors, we've seen and experienced the incredible strain and even harm that these major disruptions can cause both to those who are doing the work and to those who need the services. And that was all too clear when it comes to the parts of the social safety net that so many of our community members um, are employed in and even community members more who depend on. Services like behavioral health treatment, especially for mental health and substance use disorders that our clients need now more than ever. Or affordable, accessible childcare and early learning, which the pandemic exposed as a, as those, those of us who already knew that this, but it is a critical pillar of infrastructure that holds up our society's ability to function. Today, we're going to learn more about Multnomah County's Labor Harmony Initiative, which is anchored in a commitment to maintaining vital services for our clients. And to do that, we need a stable and supported workforce. In the coming weeks, we will be establishing the administrative framework to put this policy into action. This policy comes at an opportune moment as we look to implement major investments in early learning and in behavioral health services. We have to do all that we can do to ensure that we have a workforce that's set up for stability and success to transform that funding into life changing services. The journey to get to this point has included countless hours spent analyzing the legal landscape, making adjustments as new cases were settled and engaging with advocates and partners. There are very few labor harmony agreements for social services at the jurisdictional level, although they're becoming more common. Um, we had several come online just this past year, and I really want to appreciate the efforts of everyone involved to help Multnomah County create a model of our own. And we also recognize that Multnomah County simply can't do this, all of this on our own, which is why we continue to work with state and federal partners to make lasting changes that will promote these goals. And with that, I'll turn it over to my chief of staff, Kim Milton, who will walk us through the agenda and overview for today. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I believe we can start the um, presentation slides. For the record, my name is Kim Milton. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the chief of staff for Chair Corey. And um, I'm excited to be here with you all this morning uh, with our um, with both Jenny Mancor and Brian Smith, and we're going to walk you through um, the an overview of the county's labor harmony initiative and the key policy elements and um, some of the frameworks that we've used to get here. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Oh, yes. So a little more on the agenda. We'll go through the background. We'll talk about some of the legal considerations. We'll walk through what sort of the key goals are for Multnomah County in approaching this work and the key elements of the initiative and then talk about the next steps. Uh, next slide, please. I, I think some of this, there are just a few um, key milestones uh, we wanted to note in terms of how we got to this place uh, today. And uh, in 2017, we started engaging with AFSME after the release of a report called United We Heal. And in those discussions um, with AFSME, they asked us to consider and really do some research around um, creating what was then called a labor peace concept to help improve workforce uh, challenges and disputes, particularly within behavioral health. And so that work continued um, and, and over the course of several months um, as with the balancing of other uh, initiatives and work as well. With the creation and passage of the preschool for all ballot measure in 2020, the county also had committed in conversations with, with advocates and partners there to expand the scope of the labor harmony initiative analysis to include the newly created preschool and early learning division. And so that work has continued as the legal landscape has continued to change um, almost annually or multiple times within a year around the concept of labor harmony and labor peace. And so both that changing uh, landscape around um, the legal framework and the work with our, with our advocates and within um, our organizational team um, have contributed to the current policy that you're going to hear about today. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, Good. I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Madcor to walk us through these next pieces. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Jenny Madcor, I'm your county attorney, and I'm here just to give a brief overview of some of the key terms and legal background that helps inform and guide uh, the creation of our labor harmony agreement. 
So let's just start with labor harmony. This is a policy, which is what we're being briefed on today, that really focuses on um, assuring that Multnomah County as a market participant or as a contractor can ensure that activities of unions and labor negotiations do not disrupt the continuity of services. So we're talking about strikes, walkouts, and things like that. And that's a labor harmony policy. Sometimes we also hear labor peace, um, but for the purposes of continuity, we're going to try to use some of the same terms here so that we uh, so that we don't get too twisted. The second area of key terms that's important to keep in mind is project labor agreements. Usually, uh, we'll use the alphabet soup and say a PLA. So the labor harmony agreement is the policy that would then require a project labor agreement to be negotiated between the, a union and an employer to assure that union organizing activities are continuous and that county services aren't disrupted. So it's a two-prong approach. Let's skip to the next slide so that we can talk about the market participant exception. So the National Labor Relations Act, the N. LRA, again, more alphabet soup, and Oregon labor laws generally prohibit the county from regulating labor relations or encroaching on free debate of issues between labor and management. The, the general concept here is that those discussions should happen freely and without interference between management and between labor. So that's a, a very general um, overview of the labor laws, but there is an exception and it's called the market participant exception. And in this exception, it's basically saying that the county can act as a contractor as opposed to as a regulator, right? We have these two different roles. Sometimes we're, we're acting as the employer, sometimes we're acting as a regulator. The market participant exception allows Multnomah County to develop a labor harmony policy that would then require contractors and unions to enter into a project labor agreement, again, that is intended to minimize disruption of contracted services. So that sort of lays the framework for uh, where we go from here in developing a labor harmony model. So if we can go to the next slide, please. As the chair said in her opening remarks and Kim mentioned, this legal landscape is changing and it's changing pretty rapidly. And so we looked at several other models which um, have either not been challenged or have withstood legal challenge um, coming from different jurisdictions. And here's a few examples of some of the other models that we looked at. Um, and what we did and you know, what we like to do when we're acting as an innovator as we are here is we basically sort of cherry pick the best of the best from all of the different models so that we can create uh, a labor harmony policy that will best meet the needs of Multnomah County in providing continuous service to our clients who are um, uh, in early childhood and all the, these other areas that we're looking at today. So these are just a few of the models. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about um, you know, how, how these will work best for Multnomah County. And I think that we'll see as we move forward that we really have identified a labor harmony policy that can best meet our needs and uh, effectively be uh, operationalized through our systems. Next slide, please. And Kim's gonna go from here. Thanks, Jenny. So with all of that um, framework in mind, uh, how did Multnomah County landed on sort of what are the three major goals that would be guiding um, the creation of the policy elements uh, for labor harmony? And I think the first that, that I think you've heard is around minimizing the disruption of services um, for our clients to the greatest extent possible. And that allows us to say as much as we can in building our policy um, to go as far as we can that, that really provides as much support um, and, and continuity for our community-based services that we consider to be very vital. And that to do that, we are ensuring that, that that continuity really requires a stable and supported workforce. And so those two things really book in together. And I think that we do that work within the legal frameworks that we have, continuing to pay attention, I think as Jenny has mentioned, to that changing landscape where so we can take advantage of opportunities and other best practices to continue to um, um, improve 
and and grow um, the strength of our policy where we where we can and where we need to. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of there are kind of three big areas of the policy um, that, that we're going to highlight today. And the first, we'll talk about scope and eligibility. Who does it include? We'll talk about the implementation and what that looks like when um, applications or solicitations go out and what that means when we uh, are referencing or including labor harmony uh, policy provisions in a contract. And then what happens around um, remedying any issues that come up if, if uh, a contractor or a partner is not compliant. Uh, so those are the three areas and we can go to the next slide and I'll start with the first one. The, the first area really was around scope and eligibility. And I and what we are pursuing is a focused pilot that includes the behavioral health division and the preschool and early learning division. Two divisions where we've been in a consistent conversation with both with advocates over the course of several years and where there's been specific commitment and um, conversation about the workforce landscape uh, so that we might understand the impacts of uh, any labor harmony policy. And this focused pilot allows also the county to be more flexible and adjust in real time as we're paying attention to um, the impacts of the policy on the landscape and also what's happening legally um, more broadly beyond just Multnomah County. And, uh, and who is included and eligible within those divisions. This has been an area where we have continued to look at models across the nation to find out um, how uh, how adventurous, how bold, how can can we be in terms of who we cover and how we cover them. And what we've landed on is that we will pursue a labor harmony, um, a policy to include any and all solicitations within behavioral health and within preschool and early learning division for services. And um, and that in that case, it's any solicitation that we put out at the county. And that also it would cover any contract that is over $150,000. And so this allows us to um, capture as many, um, all of our formal procurements, as well as to capture other um, major contracts for services um, as part um, within the scope of this labor harmony policy. And I think one thing I would also note is that um, within the preschool and early learning division, which is a new division, uh, brand new for the county and work that we are um, embarking on for the first time and building out. Um, we've continued to work with the division leaders and the staff to understand how this, um, how the scope of this labor harmony, harmony policy would capture um, uh, contractors and uh, p potential partners within that that division and that work uh, because we don't have sort of a, a history to look back on like we do in behavioral health we've had to be a bit more um do a little bit more research to try to project out what the impacts might be and know that we'll be continuing to learn particularly in that area over the course of the pilot um how the policy will play out and and now we will look at sort of what some of the implementation uh pieces will uh look like in the solicitation and for that i will turn it over to Brian Smith. Uh, next slide, please. Good morning, uh, Chair and board members. I'm Brian Smith. I'm the county's purchasing manager, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, as we looked at the implementation for this policy, um, and most of these will be um, through formal solicitations um, and trying to figure out what language we are going to use both in solicitations as well as in the resulting contracts. Um, the uh, for the solicitations, we're really using language based on what Seattle used. Um, it's a modification of that. And Brian, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Your your um, audio is a little off. It's a little static. off. I'm it's sorry. Staticky. I'm sorry. I will. New headphones. Sorry. Um, is this better? Okay. I apologize. Um, the um, try one other thing. Okay, is this at all better? I hope. 
So much better. So much better. Thank you. I apologize for that. Um, so as we were looking at the implementation, um, we really were focused on um, uh, first coming up with language for the um, sourcing events that are that are coming out for these two uh, divisions. And in the sourcing events, we're including two unscored questions in the events so that we can start to gather this information. And the first is a required field with a yes or no response. And this is what it reads. It says, the county values agencies that work to prevent labor disputes, which may lead to work stoppages or adversely impact the ability of our programs to achieve our intended outcomes. And please indicate if your agency is committed to avoiding labor disputes that disrupt services by checking the appropriate box. And this is simply a yes or no. And once again, it's unscored. So we're we're um, letting suppliers know that that this is a value that the county has, and this is a policy, um, which becomes very important later on as we get to contract negotiation. And then the second is an optional field that reads, if your organization has standard practices and policies that uphold this principle, such as a labor harmony agreement or collective bargaining agreement, please attach it with your submission in a separate file. So once again, we're collecting those if they exist and that's optional, they may not exist. And I think um, to the introduction, uh, uh, Chair Kafori, that you made, um, there aren't a lot in this area. So this is something that we'll be um, uh, collecting at the time of the sourcing event. Um, the first sourcing event uh, that we have this in is actually the Behavioral Health Resource Center Services, um, which just opened on Friday and it closes November 10th. Uh, so it has this language in it. And the uh, the next sourcing event that will be up will be the um, request for programmatic qualifications uh, for preschool uh, providers, which is slated to open uh, next week. Uh, so that'll that will also have this language in it. And the information that we um, gather at the solicitation is then available to the program uh, as they enter into any contract negotiation uh, with any successful suppliers for, um, uh, uh, for services. And so, um, and then we've been working with the county attorney's office to develop standardized um, contract uh, language around this so that we've got consistent implementation when it comes to the contracting phase. Next slide. I think this one's me. And this um, one's, yes. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, so we're just talking about here some of the provisions that are going to be in our labor harmony and PLA. So as Brian said, we looked to Seattle to get this very straightforward but clear communication from a prospective contractor that they are certifying their commitment to labor harmony and are aware that they'll be required to negotiate a PLA upon a successful award and contract negotiation. Um, I look at this as uh, it's, it's beautiful in its simplicity, it's easy, it's understandable, and it lays the groundwork for future negotiations. Um, the PLA comes in the contract negotiation stages. And again, um, to repeat, this is between the contractor and uh, the union. So it's the employer and the union. And this is an agreement that they reach themselves. We can be, um, we can encourage them and we can provide some examples of other successful PLAs, but it really is um, an opportunity for management and labor to negotiate a PLA that's gonna be workable for their particular circumstances. And um, the county will not be mandating terms in that PLA. So that's, that's an important to know, but again, we're, we're rolling back to our goals as a market participant. We're gonna be minimizing disruption of services or other economic interference. And then with added benefit of stabilized workforce and um, other workplace uh, goals. Then we come into um, if the labor organization and the employer cannot reach an effective PLA within 60 days, our, our labor harmony policy has a mediation and then a mandatory arbitration um, requirement. So that really gets then into, um, you know, where is, where is the incentive, right? What's the incentive for the employer and the labor organization to, to reach a, a, 
mutually agreeable PLA. So the first prong is going to be that um, mediation and then arbitration section. And now if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, that we also have a remedies provision in our labor harmony policy that says failure to implement a PLA may first we have, you know, first, we always like the lighter touch, right? I think good public contracting, good business services, and um, ultimately, you know, just client satisfaction and the provision of services really requires the Multnomah County, Multnomah County as a steward to do individual outreach um, at the program manager or contract management level to attempt to find ways to actually have a contractor meet our minimum requirements, which in this case would be a PLA. So we're going to have that soft touch first, um, but then we move into the more um, uh, contractual issues like breach of contract, possible termination of contract, and then recovery, ultimately recovery of the county's associated costs with any of those actions. So in this remedy section, we, we start it really starts with mediation and possible arbitration, right? And then we roll through. The hope being that we don't get to even get to the breach of contract area. Instead, we can um, find a way to have a negotiated PLA um, and continue to provide the services that we, we saw in, in the first instance. Next slide, please. I'll hand it off to Kim. Thank you, Jenny and Brian. Um, that is the core of the uh, policy, the Labor Harmony Policy, Multnomah County's Labor Harmony Initiative. What's next? Um, the next week, uh, the board will consider a resolution of support for this labor for the Labor Harmony um, pilot initiative, and also uh, the work that Brian referenced and Jenny referenced that work with our internal partners to develop the administrative framework that we'll need to implement that will continue as well as communication um, both uh, to um, interested um, participants or uh, potential contractors and also training for our staff as needed as they look to implement uh, this this work going forward and as you saw from from what brian shared it's in real time we're having the opportunity to um to put this work, put this policy to work um, in the way that I know that um, many um, have intended and have desired around the areas of behavioral health and preschool and early learning. And so with that, um, that concludes this presentation. Happy to turn it back over to you, Chair, for questions. Thank you, team. Appreciate, again, all of the work that has gone into this. Um, so a new ground is never easy, and uh, I appreciate the commitment that you have to this project. All right, uh, Commissioner Myron, questions, comments? Thank you. Um, I, uh, I also appreciate the work that has gone into this, and I, I really appreciate, uh, Jenny, you and your team um, going through this uh, ad nauseum with me and uh, discussing some of the legal aspects of it. I, I guess I have a, a couple of sort of broader philosophical questions and then a couple of specific questions pertaining to this, uh, the labor harmony. Um, so, I first of all, in just looking at our goals that are listed, um, they're listed as sort of minimizing disruption of services to our clients, very, very important, and also the stability of the workforce, um, also very important. Uh, I personally feel that uh, really elevating the support for the workforce and doing everything that we can to support them should be a sort of separate standalone goal and what seems to be more of, you know, in keeping with the uh, United We Heal report and some requests around that. So um, have we considered that? And uh, is it just possible to at least outline that as a clearly articulated goal? Well, Commissioner Myron, from the legal lens, I think we um, we have articulated it as as a goal, um, and it really dovetails with disruption to services. So, I think the way that I would best characterize it is that it's 
clearly established that Multnomah County as a market participant um, can take actions through labor harmony policy to um, minimize disruption to services. And I think that from a philosophical level, as you say, I think that ensuring a stable workforce really dovetails into um, the ability of a market participant to assure that services aren't disrupted. So I would say it's a both and. Um, as the lawyer, I lean heavily into the disruption of services because that's what's established in case law. Um, but I think that this ensuring continuity of service, it's number two on the goals. Uh, it's important. And I think that we have, um, we are working to lift that up within the legal confines. Thank you. I think um, the the legal confines question might get me actually to the a, a related goal, and um, that is regarding labor neutrality. And I know we've had many conversations that that is different from labor harmony, and you've uh, advised uh, that legally um, we are not able to pursue le labor neutrality. Um, Obviously, I'm not the, the county attorney, but I do have a legal background and I read the law differently. And I feel there's at the very least an argument that we could make um, for labor neutrality and that we should be making that argument. Could you just briefly describe the difference between labor harmony or labor peace and labor neutrality and why we chose to pursue labor harmony and if a viable argument could conceivably be made for labor neutrality. Sure, I'll try to get I'll try to get all okay. those questions, and if I miss one, please loop back with me. So um, we've discussed what labor harmony is, and that's about minimizing disruption of services, and then other key goals like ins ensuring stable workforces and whatnot. Labor neutrality is a separate, or union neutrality is a separate concept, and that concept really says that. Um, as a contractor, we will be requiring management and labor to engage or not engage in certain behaviors, right? In this, in this case, it's telling management, you need to remain neutral in labor negotiations. When Multnomah County is asking a third party contractor or uh, employer to remain neutral, we run into issues with the First Amendment, with the NRLA, and then also with Oregon state law. Now, these areas are in flux and in progress, and there's um, there's not the um, weight of legal precedent that we would like to see that would support union neutrality. We've looked for it. Believe me, based on all the interest of this board in maintaining these the you know stable workforce, um, union neutrality is an issue that we have um, run to ground to the greatest extent possible. Um, but at this point, based on the law as it is now, and it's changing and we're watching, but as it is now, there are serious issues with including union neutrality in any sort of um, county requirement for third parties. We can tell ourselves to be uh, neutral all day long. And in fact, in preschool for all, that's what we did. We said Multnomah County will remain neutral in union um, organizing arrangements, and that's in our code. That's what the voters passed. So we can tell ourselves to be neutral. We've already done that. And that's, you know, so so that's as far as we're able to go right now, in my opinion, based on the law. And let's talk about legal opinions. You can ask three different lawyers the same question and get seven different answers, right? So, so we all know that. Um, my role as county attorney is to give my best advice based on my skills and experience um, that is in the benefit of the county for the long term. So, like we've talked about before, my advice is meant to be durable and is meant to um, defend the county as an entity to the greatest extent possible. But I am just the lawyer. So, policymakers then make the policies, right? Um, in this case, union neutrality. Um, is it's it's out there it's being talked about um but as i talked about in the beginning the basic idea of some of our labor laws is that government shouldn't be telling other um other businesses and unions how they need to do their business that's that's regulatory 
and, and we're prohibited from doing that. So right now we can mind our own house and we have done that by saying that Multnomah County will be um, neutral in, in the context of preschool for all. Um, but the, you know, taking that next step, we don't have the sort of legal precedent um, at this time, in my opinion, to support that move without jeopardizing the entire policy that we're seeking to move out right now, which is labor harmony. But never fear, because if the law changes, so then does our advice and it gives us the opportunity to take action if needed in the future. Thank you for that. And I, I, I really, I really appreciate that and your, um, you know, your work to kind of safeguard us um, as the county. And I guess, I guess I feel like, you know, we, we talk about um, being on the cutting edge or pushing the limit and we talk about that in terms of labor harmony, but that like you said, the precedents out there, like that is something that it, it feels not as much pushing the envelope as setting policies that can become that precedent that actually um, engage in the work, uh, you know, truly do push the envelope and, uh, and uh, make things uh, better for the workforce. And so I would encourage um, us as a board to be considering moving in that direction because I think that valid arguments can be made and that we should be um, should be doing that. It also, you know, I'm, I'm curious in the negotiations, given how many communications we've received regarding particularly preschool for all, um, and, and I think some of those wanna go even further than labor neutrality, which I do agree um, would be uh, legally you know, we, we would not be able to do that legally, uh, but at least labor neutrality, has that come up in the negotiations with our partners as we've been trying to, uh, like, is that what they have, have asked for or has it all been about labor harmony and like that's, that's sort of fine um, being there? I'll, I'll, I'll defer to, to Kim and others on the discussions with partners. I will point out though, that when we talked about the other models that we looked at, one of the models was the Montgomery model. And they specifically looked at union neutrality and specifically decided not to follow it because it was questionable under the first amendment, the National Labor Relations Act and other, um, other legal issues. So, you know, it's, I haven't found the model where it's been successful. So there's the edge, there's the bleeding edge, and then there's over the edge. And I think <laughs> when we're talking about union neutrality, where you know you 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 all get to decide. Um, but um, at this point, I would I um, legally I think that your your uh, the chair's team has put together a, a policy along with Brian Smith and others that is workable, um, that is durable and that can be flexible to the needs of the community moving forward. I guess so, so that just leads to the, and I, I really appreciate that. I would love to continue to have those broader conversations about labor neutrality. Um, and I think for this specific labor harmony agreement, and hopefully these questions are a little more, you know, sort of discreet, um, I'm not sure what, as a board were I, I I think I I get the language and but I'm not sure what we as a board are adding here or seeking to add in um I think we're looking at adopting a resolution um for t given that I I think this is an executive rule um there's language, you know, none of the language that says, do you value avoiding work disruptions? I mean, first of all, who's going to say no? And, you know, on, and then even if they like, it's not, it's not, un, it's not scored anyway. Like what it, I'm not sure what we're adding with, I mean, I, I value labor harmony. We need to keep the stability of the workforce. What is it we're trying to do with the board's action? 
So perhaps, like uh, Commissioner, I will Thank take you. a yeah. um, crack at explaining sort of the 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 situation. So I I would uh, maybe say a few things. I think one in the framework of um of labor harmony and in this sort of industry of work part of what what we why we've pursued a pilot so i just want to address a couple pieces one of the reasons why this is a the labor harmony initiative begins with a pilot allows us to be flexible and responsive it also allows us to evaluate over these next two years what has happened what the impact has been and to have the opportunity for the review of that that rule is implementation and opportunities, obviously, to continue to quality improve and assess the environment that's around us. So I think that this step allows us to step into a place we haven't been, but it does so recognizing that um, we're probably going to learn some things over the next couple of years. And those things may be around the legal landscape, that may be around the research, it may be around how we work with our partners, it may be around what PLA, best PLAs look like. So. I think there's some really um, sound, um, a sound place to start there, and also that has that forward-looking piece that I think this board has wanted to con to continue to have to look towards where we can continue to innovate. On the space of how we're implementing this right now, this um, this this policy around is an administrative. Uh, does fall into the space of administrative procedures under an executive rule and so in that in that way falls under the chair's authority what we what we know and what we've also experienced as a board is that sometimes there's been a desire among the board to make um make clear and make public sort of the support for a policy or an initiative and the way that i've um described it to to advocates and also to other colleagues has been if we were to look back into april when we passed the racism as a public health crisis board resolution which really was an opportunity to just to say this type of initiative this type of approach and policy is something that this board um values and wants to see implemented throughout our organization and that means we're going to pay attention to it and we want to signal this to our community and also signal, signal signal it to the organization at large and so the way that we've crafted the initial drafts of the resolution around labor harmony really mirror the the approach that that was taken around the drafting of that resolution that the board took and so which which is a little bit around a statement it is also about calling out the policy and why it, it that in support of the policy and why. And so that's the way we're looking at the way that a resolution can add additional value and add additional weight um, that supports um, even an executive action that um, that is taking place. So that's the way that um, I'd be framing it. Is that that help? Okay. Yeah, no, that that totally helps. So um, so Thank you for that. And I know everyone, there's going to be many more questions probably. So I do have a couple of other questions, but I'll just um, raise those directly with you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, um, Kim and Jenny and Brian. Really, really appreciate the work that's gone into this. Uh, you know, 2017 to now, it's a long time. So the time itself tells us the amount of work that's gone into it, and I know it's been complicated. And I also really want to appreciate the advocates um, who've hung with the process and, you know, who whose input, I think, has made some substantial changes and really strengthened the policy even over the past couple of weeks. So really appreciate all of that input. Um, uh, I, I'll also kind of structure with philosophy and then a couple of specific questions, and I want to appreciate the, the philosophical or sort of larger macro issues that Commissioner Myron raised, because they are both issues that I have been thinking about as well. Um, and, and start with the, the point about really elevating supporting workers. You know, Kim, I think building off of the rationale for the resolution, which, which makes a lot of sense to me um, as a way of the board signaling that these are the things that we're interested in, this executive rule and this procurement process is one way to implement those policy interests, and there may be others in the future. So with that context, I would say that, you know, I I do feel it would be worthwhile to, to have supporting the workforce as a separate plank. And I think, Jenny, to your point, it fits with the overall purpose of the county in this instance, acting as a market participant, you know, for the purposes of procurement. 
but it would also say to to us to 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 you know to as we move forward in the work we also want to look for other ways in which to support workers so I, I i don't know what the drafting of that would look like i'm you know just 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 saying that i would be interested in seeing if we can add something stronger around supporting workers to to the statement um in terms of labor you know neutrality um i I, 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 too, have had questions about whether, even if others haven't done it, there is a legally defensible argument um, for doing it. I am okay with where we are because, as I understand it, and, you know, Commissioner Myron raised the question, I'd be interested in the answer, but as I understand it, advocates also, for now, given the legal landscape, are satisfied with labor peace or labor harmony is the approach. Um, but I, I guess I'm wondering is one way to signal, another way to signal our interest in even going further, whether there's a way to build that into the review that we're gonna be doing. So in a couple of years, we're gonna be reviewing how this pilot is working. Is there a way to signal specifically that at that point, we'd like to reevaluate whether neutrality is something that we can do? So I'll just put that out there and see if any, anyone has any thoughts about that. I would just say we can, uh, I'm sure we can talk about it. I don't know that, I mean, we can, we can have suggestions for the board in three years on any, uh, you know, any number of issues, whether or not they choose to do that is up to them, I would say, but um, we can talk more about that. Yeah, I think that's with resolution in general. So I, I think, I think the point of the resolution is for this board to signal its interests and um, that might be. Okay. Uh, I see what you're saying. Yes. No, that, that sounds good. Um, and then just a couple of specific questions. So this also going back to that unscored question, I guess I'm wondering what the purpose of that unscored question is. If there's no consequence to it, you know, why, why, why are we asking it? I get that we're signaling our desire to go there, but then if somebody says no and we still award a contract, aren't we just then just sort of lengthening our process because we've got a partner who, who doesn't share that interest? <laughs> Commissioner Jayapal, I think the the idea behind asking it at that point in the procurement process when um, we don't know who we're going to be contracting with, right? And so one of the things that um, we had talked about is when do we get this information, which is helpful to have when we get to contract administration, right? It's helpful to have this information, whether or not there's an actual agreement in place and whether or not um, they are, the, the, the contractor is um, amenable to supporting this policy or not. Um, and this gets back to, it's not, if you say no to that question, it doesn't, it doesn't disqualify you, but that's an important piece of information for, um, the program folks to know as they go into contract administration around this particular area. And um, so as we were looking at the procurement process and where's the right time to get that, we talked about the different the different places. Do we do it after we make an award? And we say, oh, by the way, um, you know, we have this policy and that's the first time they're ever hearing of it. That, that that's too late to be introducing this as something that we uh, as Multnomah County are going to require in the contracts that are gonna result from the sourcing event. And so the asking it at the front end and saying, if you're gonna submit, we'd like to know this information as well. And it informs the contract negotiation process. So that's why that's why it lands where it does in the in the procurement process. And the idea was to make it as um, low barrier as possible for contractors in terms of being able to 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 either view or participate in the in the sourcing event at all, right? And um, because it it really becomes important at contract negotiation, which happens after after the sourcing event itself. So um, it's just a yes or no. And if you've got an agreement that you can upload, great. You know, and and that's about as low barrier as we can be in a sourcing event for uh, to be able to implement this policy. I, I appreciate that. I completely appreciate that. It makes sense to ask it at the beginning as opposed to as opposed to down the road. Yes. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, 
why not make it a scored question if they say no um why why would we want to go forward um initially when we talked about that that it would be more market participant like if we had it unscored um J jenny do you um, i'm curious about that, that sounds like <laughs> that a was jenny. The think i mean that was the thinking behind it so. yeah i think that um there's i would loop back to saying this is a pilot and um when we make something a scored piece of the criteria, it then does create barriers. So we don't know what impact or not this policy is going to have. And having this initial question really provides its expectation setting. It's an honor of the fact that we are moving into an area which Multnomah County has not um, engaged in before. And with um, with other market participants with whom we haven't engaged for with before, specifically in the area of preschool for all. Um, and it is a, I would say, a sort of prophylactic against unintended consequences so that we are um, making sure that we're not shuffling out possible contractors who um, otherwise would um, be excellent partners in the provision of county services. So, for example, there's going to be some responders who don't have a labor organized workforce. Um, and don't have any interest from labor, labor organizers at that time, right? So they, they might, their, their interests in contracting will be slightly different. And so this is um, in, in guessing what our needs are going to be in the future, um, making this a, um, an optional question to set expectations at the beginning was modeled after the city of Seattle and has been successful to our understanding in that region. And so we're saying, hey, why totally recreate the wheel, use some of the good work that's been done. If we find it doesn't serve us, we can change it. I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, um, I, it, it's probably somewhat moot because it's hard to imagine that a lot of would-be partners are gonna say that they don't want workforce stability. Um, and on the other hand, I suppose, theoretically, we could get a whole bunch of people who say that that they don't want workforce stability and then then we'd been in, we'd be in a bind if it was a, a scoring question. But um, anyway, so I'll, I'll move along to, to just one other question on the arbitration and, and mediation. Is that a requirement of mediation and arbitration between the, uh, the contracting partner and the union? Is that right, Jenny? It's not it's not between the county and. I mean, we may have separate arbitration provisions, but the one that we're talking about here is between the employer and the, the labor organization or employee group. Is that right? Right. It's in order to get the PLA agreed upon in the first place. Yeah. Okay. And in that context, would an arbitrator actually decide the terms of a PLA? Like, I'm, I'm curious about how, how arbitration would work in, in this context. Well, presumably in this context, they, yeah, they would have binding arbitration would mean that at the end of it, an arbitrator would make a decision about which terms are going to go forward or not. And so um, I admit I haven't dove into that question a great deal, um, but it is it is our including those provisions again modeled after other jurisdictions is our attempt to um, have a what if. We, what if you don't? What if you don't enter into a PLA? What happens then, right? And so it's our, um, it's as a market participant, we are pushing the contractor to actually do what they said they were going to do and what we are asking them to do, which is to have a PLA with their union organizations. And so sometimes third parties are necessary to make that happen. Um, and so we would look towards the mediator and if that doesn't work than an arbitrator to give that final binding decision. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and again, just just thank you all. And, uh, you know, this I think we're I, I think this policy is in a much stronger place than it was 2 or 3 weeks ago and uh, really appreciate the work that's gone into making that happen. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you chair. Um, so, 1st of all, I, I do want to thank. Um, everybody who's worked so hard on this, Brian and Jenny and your team and Kim and also Adam, you know, in the chair's office for all of this work. 
I think um, the proposal that we're working that we're looking at right now is like a much stronger and um, definitely, you know, broader um, than I think the initial proposal that we had been looking at a few weeks ago. And so I appreciate all the work that's gone on trying to um, address a lot of the concerns that were raised by OSCME and the UPN implementation team. Um, and I know like our offices as well um, on the board, because um, I think that, you know, we're all trying to see how we can um, reflect our values, our Multnomah County values in our contracting process and especially with um, you know, and especially in the areas of behavioral health, because we have known that this is that there are so many challenges um, in behavioral health workforce with with stress, with wages, with all of that. And how do we, you know, how do we express our values in a policy like this? And then with preschool for all, I mean, this was part of the you know initial discussions that we had in terms of um, what is needed in the in the in the workforce in childcare and preschool. Um, and this was a this was a huge piece of it. So I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. I will, you know, um, kind of mirroring um, my colleagues who've started like philosophical and then gone more um, specific. You know, I will say I agree and appreciate raising the questions of where we are with labor harmony versus you know labor neutrality, which is really what the phrase we were using when we were when we were talking about this back in 2017 was really how do we get to the labor neutrality. Um, and, you know, and I would just say that I think I understand that right now there isn't kind of a like the the legal roadmap of how you get to to um, labor neutrality in a way that can be justified. But, you know, I think at Multnomah County, we've really pushed on policies that were legally uncertain and have actually changed precedent, like we've done with campaign finance and other things. And, you know, part of part of changing that legal landscape is is trying to see um, if there are policies that will withstand, you know, up to up to legal opinion. So I know it's a kind of, that's kind of a, a dicey and gray area to be in. But I I just as we learn from this pilot, and I, you know, that's something that I do want us to explore in the future. Um, I I will say that um, I you know where we are right now though, like I said, is is is. I think broader and stronger than where we were a few weeks ago and really appreciate that. Um, I'm, you know, in the, when we looked at the other jurisdictions and the other, um, you know, the other um, areas where we we're looking at models, I think it's also interesting to see where they were, where they are using um, labor harmony agreements, um, you know, as we're looking at this as a pilot in these two areas where there's potential for growth and how we, we might be able to expand this in the future. Um, I know we looked at, um, what the city of Seattle was doing a lot when we were talking about preschool for all and the model they have there. So I'm not surprised that that we were able to use that as an example in this case as well. Um, you know, I um, so I, I you know, so I, I'm interested in like saying like how can we use what other jurisdictions are doing to to look at expanding this. I did have a couple of questions. One of them was how does this work? How is this going to work with subcontracting? Because when we talk about preschool for all, we do talk about having, you know, having subcontracting, especially for some um, some of the different providers, like using that model. So how would how would our labor harmony agreement work in that situation? Or what would you know what what how did it, how is that or isn't that encompassed in this labor harmony agreement? Um, Commissioner Vega Peterson, that's an excellent question. And uh, one of the things that we will be sure to address in the um, in the final lang contract language um, at, at this point, we still uh, have drafts of that. Um, I think in general, though, um, the way subcontracting works with county contracts is we have provisions that flow down. You know, if it's in the contractor's contract, it's going to flow down to the subcontracting. And so one of the things that we would need to do in the language is be very explicit about that. And um, I can't speak for the policymakers, but um, I, my assumption is that we would want to do that, that same kind of thing in, in this uh, case as well. The other thing is that the we don't generally allow subcontracting. Unless, uh, Subcontract is not permitted unless we give explicit permission to do it through our contract as well. So that's another kind of just check on the process. Okay, that's actually really helpful. Thank you, Brian. Because I think one of the questions is really like how how with this policy that we're putting in place for behavioral health and for um and for the um, preschool and early learning division, like how much of the contracts are we capturing with this, right? 
And one of the things that I really appreciate is the change is the change in the threshold and, and using the $150,000 threshold um, to, to try to capture a bigger um, piece of this and really recognizing, you know, kind of just the realities of what the contract sizes might be in some of these situations. <clears throat> and I think that I think that like how things flow down from contracts um, to subcontracts and things like that is also really helpful in, in again, trying to say, how are we going to be capturing and making sure that this policy that we're implementing and we want to, you know, we want to implement as Multnomah County does actually have the impact that we want on the ground level. So um, I, you know, I appreciate this. I, I also appreciate the, um, the opportunity for the board to weigh in on this. Um, because I do think that, you know, just like um, Kim and I think that the example of um, racism is a public health issue is a great example. Like this is a policy and this is a value that we want to show that we support, even though that is um, the authority to do this is wrapped up in the chair's office. So um, just appreciate all of the work that's gone into this and, um, and this um, briefing and discussion today. So thank you. Thank you all. And we have one more um, briefing item this morning, so I hope everyone can stick around. Um, we have uh, in our continuation of reviewing the impacts of state, federal, and other funding changes to the county's uh, budget, we've got Christian Elkin and company health department. Christian, you want to ground us for as we quickly change our hats into uh, and, and change our focus onto a completely different topic. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Christian Elkin, Budget Director. I use she, her pronouns. It's nice to be here uh, this afternoon. We, uh, this is our third work session out of three to bring you the topic of the state and federal rebalance to discuss uh, additional investments from the state and the federal government and um, maybe changes in our ARP allocations within the departments. Um, this work session will be followed by a board vote on Thursday, where we are scheduled to actually implement the state and federal uh, changes to our actual budget. And so um, with that, I will turn it over to the health department to start their presentation today. Thank you. So I'll just do a quick overview and turn it over to um, Jessica and Julie. And so, Wendy, their health department deputy director, um, Jessica will start out uh, the presentation reviewing the changes to the public health division, and then she'll turn it over to uh, Julie Dodge, the interim behavioral health director, to review the changes in the behavioral health division. Those are the only two divisions in the health department that had um, changes to their state and federal allocations. and. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, our government relations partners are still here um, because their input may be useful in answering some of your questions when we get down to the behavioral health section. So with that, I will turn it over to um, Jessica. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jessica Guernsey. Um, I use she, her, her pronouns, uh, public health director at Multnomah County. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I'm going to try and power through this. Um, so this is a overview slide of our public health rebalance um, with an increase of just a little bit over 2.4 million. Um, this covers um, several areas, um, including uh, extending our vaccine incentive program um, until November 12th, which we were before you all, um, I believe, last week to discuss. Um, with a million dollars, um, rebuilding the public health vaccination program um, after several years of budget cuts. Um, we are um, obviously not wanting to replicate the situation we were in before with not having the foundational structure of a vaccination program, um, seeing as how we're in a pandemic. So building out permanent positions to, to build that back out. Um, and then um, some grant funds that um, continue some of our work, a supplemental grant to our REACH program that focuses on access to flu and COVID-19 vaccination. Additionally, we're receiving a little bit over $250,000 um, for our case increase in WIC. Um, so this will, excuse me, $155,000 in WIC um, from state funding. For, this will um, allow us to serve about almost 60 additional families 
and then a little bit of funding to add um, some public health administrative capacity um, into our chronic disease and health promotion program. And then um, the last uh, piece, uh, other funding that is not um, the other two buckets, uh, we have an increase in our um, vector control activities um, to the tune of about 65,000. This is for um, enforcement of specified animal permits. So this is for things like bees, goats, chickens, et cetera. And then um, a small amount of funding, about 98,000 to um, build the capacity to uh, monitor and evaluate and assess our syringe exchange services. Next slide, please. So um, I mentioned this a little bit and I'll just skim through these because I know we're short on time, but um, for the vaccination program, um, some of you may recall um, that we um, turned back, um, we cut this program uh, two years ago, I believe two years ago, um, and um, turned back some of these responsibilities and worked with our FQHC to ensure some of these services continued. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, we we really went below the, the bar, so to speak, in terms of um, some of the decisions we had to make and really are interested in rebuilding much of this work um, through some of this funding. This will allow us to um, help schools and child care facilities um, comply with our state immunization rules, um, obviously contributing to safe learning environments. Um, it, it also creates a safety net, um, which we understand now is, is really desperately needed regardless of um, overarching coverage for children. There are still gaps in terms of um, vaccine eligibility, um, and we're seeing some of that now. So we are um, thrilled to be able to rebuild um, some of that work. Um, next slide. And then, as I mentioned, um, the supplemental grant that we received, um, this helps build out uh, the health equity work uh, out of reach. Um, again, focusing on specifically COVID-19 vaccination and flu vaccination. So you'll continue to hear more about that work um, as we build that out over the fall and winter. Next slide. And then this is just a little bit about the specifics of what the work pays for. Um, this includes um, social media and digital campaigns, um, the virtual education forums um, that many of you par have participated in through the last year. Um, we have specific vaccination clinics um, on a weekly and monthly basis that are offering both um, a COVID-19 vaccine and flu vaccine. and um, Reach has also been hosting a wonderful podcast um, as a black doctor with over 15,000 um, participants, and we're going to continue doing that work um, through the winter. Next slide. And these are just a few samples of um, both um, actually the reach um, campaign and forums and um, also, yeah, the um, flu vaccine and COVID-19. So these are just some of the forums that I know some of you have participated in. Next slide. And then a little bit about WIC. Um, I feel like I haven't talked about WIC in front of um, the board in a long time. Um, WIC has managed to pivot to complete telehealth um, in the face of the pandemic and has actually increased our caseload, which is why we saw the financial increase from the state. They have continued to provide amazing services to ensure access to healthy foods, nutrition, um, focused counseling, breastfeeding, peer support, and community referrals. So our caseload has actually gone up. So it's a positive feedback loop in which the state provides additional funding to serve more families. We're very excited about that. Next slide. And then just this is a little bit about who we serve in WIC, and I'd be happy to come back and talk um, more about this. Um, but uh, we serve uh, close to um, 40 percent of all Multnomah County families, about 24 percent of our families speak a language other than English. Um, we provide comprehensive bicultural and bilingual services, both for nutritional counseling and breastfeeding support. Next slide. And then this is just a little bit about our demographics. As you can see on the slide, as I mentioned, we serve a very diverse um, group of families in Multnomah County. Next slide. And then just to touch on a little bit about the upcoming public health funding. Um, so as you all may know, um, there is a $45 million statewide increase 
for public health modernization, which we are thrilled to, to be a part of um, and appreciate everybody's support on this. Um, these um, particular areas that, that we'll focus on in this funding bucket include um, ongoing communicable disease work, which as you probably remember was um, the first area that we had investment in in public health modernization. That will continue and increase along with um, including environmental health threats, which is very timely given our work around um, uh, climate change and um, heat domes. Um, unfortunately, this summer we saw the evidence of that. Um, so these are the areas of work that we are going to be focusing on um, with this next uh, set of funding. Next slide. And then um, this includes two bodies of funding. Um, the, the first and the third, um, as I mentioned, are the public health modernization funding. So this increases our funding about, by about $3 million for the biennium, and it adds the climate change environmental health work, which is obviously, as I mentioned, um, desperately needed. And then the third column is also um, from the public health modernization funding, and this cre increases our funding by about $1.6 million for the biennium and includes um, uh, unusual funding to support the infrastructure that supports all of our public health programs. Um, so this is all a sort of the back of the house work that we need to um, support uh, uh, all of our major public health um, operations. And then in the middle, the communicable disease services expansion, the 1.6 million for the biennium, this is from the ELC funding um, that I just mentioned. So this, uh, when we were in front of you last week, I believe, uh, we talked a little bit more about the ELC funding and the ability to move some of this to communicable disease. Next slide. I think I'm turning it over to Julie Dodge. Thanks, Jessica. I'm Julie Dodge. I'm interim director of behavioral health for Multnomah County, and I use she, her pronouns, and then I will be covering the behavioral health um, rebalancing. So just this slide reflects the overview of um, the actual adjustments, which the good news is there's an increase of funding coming to us, um, the bulk of which comes through our state um, intergovernmental agreement, also known as the CIFA, um, which amounts to a total of a specific total of one million twenty thousand four hundred and five dollars. Um, what this means, uh, one, the first item is uh, the state is uh, giving us pass-through funds that will go, go directly to new narrative to support a new facility for aid and assist clients. These are clients who are unable, to, who are involved in the judicial system, but are unable to uh, participate in their defense because of mental health concerns. And so giving them safe places to stay and support and treatment is important to that. And so this will open up, a, this is opening up a new five bed facility. Um, the next two items reflect adjustments of parity rates in our substance use contracts. Um, so the good news is there's an increase. And then the last one um, covers basically an omission um, from, that the board previously approved of beginning working capital. You approved it during the budget cycle, but um, for whatever reason was omitted from the actual final papers or submissions. So this just corrects that. Um, the three and early uh, first three items um, are for six months only because our state agreement now runs on a calendar year. So we'll have a new agreement starting January 1st. So this, this just covers us July 1 through December 31st. Um, the last item on here is, oh, well, uh, Reynolds School District is contributing $37,500 to support school-based services in their, their district. Um, this is a new, Thing. They had previously not provided any funding to uh, support any of the school-based work in their in their districts. So this is a, a contribution for which we are grateful. Um, and then lastly, and we'll move to the next slide, the remainder is our um, American Rescue Plan reallocation. Um, and this is a net zero um, product. Um, this is a fluid target specific to program offer 40199D that has continued to change as the pandemic has impacted the workforce and the demand for services. The adjustments were made uh, because they were requested by our providers that we're contracting with to reflect better reflect the services that they are offering now as opposed to what we were anticipating in February of a year ago or 10 months ago, um, as well as to honor their staffing patterns, which many have moved to in more peers 
um, which, to, which has allowed them to expand their workforce and be more responsive. Um, the adjustments are also responsive to the increased demand for crisis services brought on by the pandemic. Um, and specifically, the expansion of crisis services includes $25,000 to Project Respond, which allows them to shift their staffing pro, um, pattern to have more peers and fewer licensed providers, which in some gives them more folks um, at just a slightly greater cost. Um, it also gives $46,000 to TIP Northwest to respond to um, death-related calls, um, which also includes gun violence. Um, and an additional 1.75 um, full-time equivalents to help staff our call center to respond to the increased demand um, coming through our call center. The net result for this, um, it's zero, it's flat, there's no increase or decrease, but it just directs funds differently. Um, it's a um, in, impacting how funds pass through to um, how much is we're retaining. Um, the amount also means that we have um, $205,000 in mini grants for providers to apply based on their response to the pandemic. Um, so that is the, the bulk of that. Um, next slide, please. We wanted to Next slide, please. We also want to take this opportunity to quickly because there are a lot of questions about there's uh, the legislature in the last session made some significant investments in behavioral health. Um, a lot of this is still being flushed out in terms of how it's going to be distributed, but we wanted to give you kind of a very quick, given our time, rundown of how these will be impacting us, what we know so far, what we don't know, and what we should be in, we sh should be paying attention to as we move through. Um, next slide. The biggest bucket here is $130 million for residential housing. What this includes is $5 million in planning grants to elevate underserved and diverse communities. Um, 100 grants were awarded for up to $50,000 each throughout the state. The county applied for one of these grants, um, and we were received notice this last week that we were funded to do this to provide system coordination and partnership with Joe's um, Health Share of Oregon, Washington, and Clackamas County, as well as a number of um, provider partners who submitted as part of our proposal. Um, this will help us to give voice to what we would like to have happen in our county in regards to residential and housing services for persons with behavioral health needs. Um, there will be an additional $125 million to be awarded through a RFP process that could be released in February or March of 2022, depends on how the legislature acts on it and how they use the information that they receive through the planning grants. Um, the half of these funds will be one time only, and the other half will help to pay for um, ongoing costs. Um, the priorities for this RFP are supposed to be guided by the results of the planning process, the planning grants. So we don't know exactly how the funds will be distributed yet, but we hope to be able to have voice again through our successful grant, um, our successful planning grant. Um, and we believe that the county would be able to apply for behavioral health resource center to support some of the housing needs um, as part of that funding. That is what we are anticipating. Next slide, please. So um, there's $121 million to support the CCBHCs, which are Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. These are not funds that come to us. They go directly to providers. They are a federal program um, that uh, expands fun federal funding or builds on federal funding for 24-7 access to behavioral health services in underserved areas. There are 15 CCBHCs throughout the state, of which two serve Multnomah County, they are Cascadia and LifeWorks Northwest. Um, this is a federal demonstration project that provides enhanced Medicaid rate payment. Um, these funds helps to stabilize those. And uh, there was some shakiness during the last program year around this funding, which put to our two providers, LifeWorks and Cascadia, in a precarious place. And the county did offer support to them as a result of that. So this helps those providers remain, retain their stability and uh, allows them to continue those services. 
And while we are not a direct recipient of these funds, they support our county goals for increased access to behavioral health services. Next slide, please. So this is a big controversy. It's the workforce development. And I know many of you saw the op-ed that we uh, published two weeks ago. Um, there's, there is a huge concern about the work status of the workforce related to the pandemic, but these funds predate that concern. And I specifically want to acknowledge this is through House Bill 2949, and I specifically want to acknowledge Ebony Clark for her advocacy, which contributed to the development of this bill, which really is about increasing the diversity and the sustainability of our workforce and behavioral health. Um, it is a one biennium funding package to support recruitment and retention of behavioral health workforce and um, specifically to engage persons of diverse backgrounds representing underserved and rural populations. $60 million of this will be administered by the Oregon Health Authority with that process being still in development to support individuals who are engaged in their professional development and training from higher education to licensure, certification, and resources to support those, everything from loan forgiveness to child care to retention bonuses and tuition assistance. Another 20 million is set aside to support clinical supervision that is required for practitioners to become licensed or certified. Of that, up to $7 million will be distributed across the street to the local county mental health programs. So potentially us, we could be a recipient for that to help support clinical licensure supervision or certification supervision. That process for how that will be determined is, is not yet um, established. Um, some folks are asking if these funds can be used to address the current workforce crisis. The short answer is maybe yes, um, but limited by how the funds were allocated in the bill. And as it is a short term one biennium, it's insufficient to lead to increased salaries, which would be a big part of workforce sustainability. However, I would suggest this would be a good item for the board to watch and consider advocacy for continuation beyond this biennium. Next slide, please. Um, there are $50 million set aside for what we are calling behavioral health transformation. This effort is being led by Senator Lieber and Representative Nose for leading a planning group in which we are participating. I am active member of that board of that committee. The intent is to assess the for funding formula and the outcomes um, for behavioral health services throughout the state, which we will hope will lead to a, a revision of our state contract and hopefully a more accurate payment model for Multnomah County. Um, we should also give some kudos to our government relations who have been working diligently with the state to help identify what are some of those flaws um, and how can we potentially improve that. Um, we are also hosting multiple visits with legislators um, who are champions for behavioral health, and we want to help them understand what the state does and does not fund and what our CFAC does or that agreement does and how much our county contributes beyond that intergovernmental agreement to submit to sustain behavioral health services. Of note, you should know that we are hosting next week on the 19th uh, Rep Representative Nose, Senator Lieber, and Representative Sanchez. And then we'll also be uh, meeting individually with Representative Nils on the 29th. And again, the big shout out to Sarah Lochner and Government Relations for walking us through and planning for these visits. Next slide, please. So um, there's an incentive fund, which is also tied to behavioral health housing. These are lottery bonds, which will not be sold until later in the biennium, likely will not be available until 2023. And these will be dispersed by a request for proposal for which we may be able to apply. Um, and we could use these funds um, to address any needs that are identified in the current um, planning grant that aren't funded by other resources or new uh, options as they come forward. Um, and we'll, yeah. Uh, Right now, those funds are in the future, so that's uh, what we have for now. Next slide, please. And this is another one to pay attention to. There's $10 million currently um, set aside for mobile crisis. These were funds that are part of House Bill 2417, which some people knew of, know of as the CAHOOTS Bill, which was championed by Representative Sanchez, but was combined with um, the 988 Crisis Bill. 
There are $10 million to set aside to support mobile crisis throughout the state, and this will be dispersed to counties and cities through contract amendments in a non-competitive way. This could, there's discussion that there may be more dollars added to this to support mobile crisis as this is a, a need seen in the legislature. What you should probably know is that we currently, our mobile crisis response is Project Respond, and you've heard about Project Respond in other presentations. But you should know that currently, uh, about 1.6 million of the, our funding for Project Respond comes through our intergovernmental agreement. Another 1.5 million comes from Health Share, and the county contributes $442,000 in county general funds to stand up our mobile crisis response. So of that three and a half million, um, it seems like a good big chunk of money, um, but we know that we are still not able to provide the level of service that we want, that we are frequently at capacity and would benefit from an expansion. Um, at the same time, we need to be thoughtful about how we approach mobile crisis to show fairness to other counties that have no mobile crisis, but while recognizing that we are 20% of the state's population. Next slide. In terms of the remaining investments, just a quick, over, quick slide through. Um, there's $57 million in other state behavioral health um, pieces, including $31 million at the state hospital. That benefits us by um, increasing access to the, the hospital. It reduces the, shall we say, log jam in our local systems. Um, we won't receive these funds but it could improve our access and demand locally. In terms of youth services, much of this is still being discussed, but may also include mobile crisis specifically for youth. And then finally, the, uh, well, the 5 million for the 988 crisis hotline. Right now, the bulk of this is going towards Lines for Life as they are preparing, and the, the, the state as they're working on their planning grant and preparing to stand up a statewide crisis line. Multnomah County is working actively with Lines for Life, Washington County, and Clackamas County to develop protocols for implementation for 988 to minimize any potential duplication or disruption to our current crisis services and hopefully create a template for the statewide implementation. In the uh, Peer Respite Centers, many of you are familiar with Kevin Fitz, who led this advocacy effort um, to create a new model for peer respite, which will be peer led, and one of those centers will be located in the Portland metro area. Um, we, is, we anticipate that this is going to be funded direct from the Oregon Health Authority to the providers, and will expand our behavioral health residential options. And I believe that was a very quick sprint through all of the things, and uh, we'll turn it back over to Wendy. Very thorough, very though. Thorough. I appreciate that. Wendy? I have nothing else to add to that presentation. I think it's turning it back over to you, Chair, um, and the board for questions. Great, thank you. All right, commissioners, questions, comments? Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Vega Peterson. Great, um, thank you so much for um, that really, really wonderful detailed presentation um, on all of the different aspects. Um, it was great to hear how um, the additional dollars are helping us invest more in um, in programs um, that we know are impactful to our community. Um, and, it, and Jessica, you had said it had been a while since we had heard about WIC and um, and the work that um, WIC was doing. And I think you know, especially during COVID, like the um, needs of the of that community it serves were so great. Um, Julie, thank you for the really great detailed look at the all of the different behavioral health investments that the state has made and where and how Multnomah County might be able to benefit from those different investments. Um, I, um, I, you know, I've had conversation with legislators and um, legislators about the workforce and, you know, the workforce needs and, you know, and I know that representative knows specifically was like, we didn't, you know, this incentive program where it's, where it's so necessary, it doesn't actually address the larger issue. It's really the focus and um, thank you, Ebony, for your work on getting that done. And so that's still the unfinished business that, you know, we're looking at. Um, I am glad that you are at the table in terms of the, um, the behavioral health um, transformation work that's happening though, um, and to have that county perspective. I, I mean, I don't have a question. I just, in general, you know, just my concern in terms of how um, the state is doing this funding is it seems that we are um, 
in some ways the county still received direct funding, but in other ways we're moving away from direct funding of county services. And I know that that makes sense in some ways for some parts of the state, but I am concerned about the impact on Multnomah County, what we've traditionally served, how we've worked with our community-based partners and what, you know, what the new system that we're moving to really looks like as we're funding different things directly with grants or, or to partners. So I appreciate you being at the table and keeping us updated on that. So thank you, no questions. Commissioner Jaipal. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Jessica, Julie, and Wendy. This was really, really helpful. Um, no questions, just a couple of comments. Uh, public health, I want to I want to call out REACH um, for all of the great work they do. I got, a, I got a chance to see some of it in action. I was at Dawson Park last week, and there was a vaccination clinic happening, and I think REACH was present. I didn't have a chance to connect, but there was a long line of people around the park, and it just warmed warmed my heart to see that so thank you for that um, um julie thank you so much for that that outline of of the the state investments i've seen this described before but i think this is the first time that i've actually understood the different pieces of it so um really really appreciated it no questions just um it is it is going to be transformative potentially even understanding what the gaps are when I when I see the the components that are being laid out it does feel as if we're getting closer to filling some of the gaps in our system and so that is exciting to see and I I too appreciate it the way that you called out where there are going to be chances for the county to participate in that funding so um again no questions just really appreciate the information thank you Commissioner Myron Thank you. I uh, just want to add to the appreciation uh, that is being expressed by my colleagues and, um, you know, Jessica, to you and your team as as always for the incredible work in public health and uh, in that update on particularly on the efforts um, uh, with vaccinations and uh, Julie, you know, great job sort of setting out the the complexity of how that funding uh, travels for behavioral health, and um, I, and I, I, we can talk about it offline. I know we're going super late, um, but the the one question I do have is about the nine, uh, not just the nine eight eight, but um, Senator Wyden's like one billion dollars in federal Medicaid match. Um, I think is how they're going to do it for. Um, mobile outreach and that there is a huge opportunity potentially that's going to be coming up in um, that is different from the 10 million dollars that you mentioned and uh, how you know how we're engaging in that uh, especially considering we're doing project respond that there's Portland Street response um, there's overlap of so many entities doing that mobile outreach work. There's the city, there's the county, and how um, how we might be connecting and collaborating and putting it all together and um, getting some of that, you know, billion dollars or what it, whatever that amount is going to be. How we're engaging in that work. So I think uh, you raise good note that we are working on the uh, continuing to refine and define that continuum of mobile crisis. What does Portland Street Response do well? What does Project Respond do that is different? And they are different. Um, Portland Street Response is more focused on the chronic spaces, whereas Project Respond is more acute. Um, but I think there's you know definitely room for us to continue to navigate that discussion. But in terms of um, uh, Senator Wyden's idea, I actually would defer to Sarah Lochner if she's still on the call. Um, we have been putting together an idea board based on her prompting to give some some uh, thoughts into some of the things that the Senator is working on. But if Sarah is available to speak to that, I think she would be far better equipped than I at this moment. Or just good morning. Good morning, Chair and Commissioner Myron, Sarah Lochner. She, her pronouns, Deputy Director of Government Relations. Um, I don't have any particular answers for you today, um, but we are meeting with the Oregon Health Authority soon to um, talk about what this money means and how it might um, come benefit the county. So TBD, but thank you for the question. I'll follow up with you at a later date when I know more. 
Super. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, great, great presentations, great information. And thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. I just want to say how good it feels as someone who's been around for a lot of those budget cuts that Wendy talked about um, and Jessica talked about to our public health team, the vaccinations, the WIC. Um, I just, it feels really good to be in the position right now where we can, um, where we can be adding back to these really crucial programs. So it was a little bright spot for me today and it's all thanks to you, Jessica Guernsey. All right. <laughs> Yay. Take it. Uh, Christian, did you want to remind us again what the next step is? Just so that hey, somebody tuned in late. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Christian Elkin, Budget Director. Our next steps are that um, you heard lots of good news this round for our state and federal rebalance, which is a departure from where we've been in past years. And so we need you to formalize these actions. We have a presentation set out for you for Thursday. Uh, a, Kind of an overview by each department. Each department will have representatives available in case you have follow up questions. But it really will be that opportunity to uh, for you all to affirm the bud mods and appropriate the funding so that we can start spending this funding in fiscal year 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. So that is the end of our agenda today. We will be back on Thursday so we can. Press the green button on all of these items and get the money out the door and continue serving our community. So thanks all. Stay safe, stay healthy, and don't forget to get your flu shot. <laughs>